In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. These days, the power of words to change hearts and minds is not very much contested, especially when you look at all the stuff happening in the news that involves words. For example, uh, the U.S. presidential debates have had a huge impact on the politics in that country. Um, you know, President Obama's poor debate performance in his first debate against uh, the candidate Romney uh, was, was a really telling thing. People before the debate said, oh, you know, these debates really don't matter that much. They don't really swing people's opinion. And then that debate happened, and in fact, there was a big shift of opinion. Um, another example of the power of words in today's press might be the case of a, of a young woman who uh, committed suicide because she was being bullied online, uh, on the internet, by uh, what they call trolls, people that sort of like to just criticize and tear down anyone they can, they can find. And uh, she committed suicide because she uh, felt so bad about herself because of the power of these words. In the lesson from Hebrews, we have one of my favorite images in the whole Bible, the word of God as a sword. Uh, the spirit as being sharper than tea, two-edged sword separating you know, flesh from spirit and, and so on. In fact, uh, on, on the stole that, I, that my mother had made for me for my ordination, I've got a sword. Uh, most of you don't get to see this because I usually have the chasuble over it, but the sword of the spirit I have right here. Um, I'm, I'm the only person that I know of that actually has a sword on a stole, which is kind of neat. And you notice it's a samurai sword because that's kind of the, the best sword that was ever made in human history, so I had to go with that. For me, that image is incredibly compelling, this idea that the Word of God is this, has this sharpness to it, that we, when we encounter it, one of the things that's distinctive about it is that sharpness. And I think we have some sense of that in our own lives, when we experience some sort of sense of conversion or some sort of sense of something that just makes us totally reorient how we understood the world, something that comes into our lives that just sharpness sort of divides us and cuts right to the quick, right to the, the, the joints and the marrow, as it says in, in Hebrews. One of the problems, however, is that we continually like to tame down that word. Uh, in the gospel, we continually want to kind of domesticate it and make it a bit safer. And today's passage is a good example of that. Um, this is a very famous passage from scripture, and it appears in, in almost the exact same form in the other synoptic gospels, in, in Luke and in Matthew, with just a few little slight changes of detail. Um, for example, in, in Luke, he's described as a ruler, you know, the, the young ruler. And in, in Matthew, he's described as being rich and young, and so, you know, we usually describe it as the rich young ruler, kind of comparing, you know, all three of those things into one image of this person who comes with great earnestness to Jesus. And the passage is full of contradictions and tensions, and we often try to resolve those and tame them down. For example, when he runs up to Jesus, he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, just imagine this, this character running up to Jesus, this guy in these beautiful robes who seems to have it all, youth and wealth and, and even power, and he runs up to Jesus and he kneels in front of him. This guy means it. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him right away, introduces the tension, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. How is that the case? I think Jesus is pretty good. Uh, I think that his disciples thought he was pretty good, and I'm sure this man who came to him and knelt in front of him thought he was pretty good. So right away, Jesus introduces this tension about what do we mean when we say goodness and so on. I think partly what Jesus is doing here is he's trying to reframe the entire question. He doesn't really want to talk about goodness. He's like saying, don't call me good. It's not about goodness, he seems to say. No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, etc. He goes through it. Here's one place where, right away, the commentators historically have begun to sort of try to soften this passage. They want to make the, this rich young ruler uh, take him down a notch. So often people say, oh, you know, he's very full of himself to think that he's followed all the commandments. But consider the context. This is a Jewish man. He has passed his bar mitzvah, which means that he is a son of the law. Uh, the idea that he would have followed these relatively basic commandments uh, is not so unusual. Uh, in fact, I think that if you were to ask most Jewish people who have gone through a bar or a bat mitzvah, I think they'd probably tell you that they haven't killed anyone since then. Uh, they, most of them probably have not committed adultery, although there may be some that have, uh, you know, and go down the list, right? I think that most people would be able to say that they have basically followed the commandments. They are sons of the law, of the covenant. And indeed, this one did. So we shouldn't fault him too much for that. But when he heard this, uh, Jesus said to him, he, well, first he looked at him. That's unique in Mark's gospel, this notion that he looks at him and he loves him. Jesus, in another translation, is pleased by what this man has said. This, Jesus sees this man and he thinks well of him. So he says, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. 
in Matthew's text it says, you know, if you would be perfect, give everything. But I kind of like Marx, you know, you, you lack one thing. Uh, there's a sharpness here, ah, you know, you're a good guy, but just one thing. And here we get this passage, go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. This is one of the scariest passages in scripture for people that want to take the scripture as being something that informs their lives. What do we do with this? Traditionally, there's several ways out of it. <laughs> one way out of it, it's very common, is to say, look, he's not saying that you actually literally have to give up all your money. Just that you have to unburden yourself. You have to detach yourself in your relationship with money. Uh, one way of uh, supporting that interpretation is to say that when we talk about the eye uh, the, of the needle and the camel going through it, they were talking about this special gate in Jerusalem that was so narrow that you could only get a camel through it if first you unburdened the camel of its load, then you get the camel through, then you hand carry the goods through. This is a very popular interpretation. The problem is it's not true. <laughs> the problem is that, although you'll hear that in some texts, there is no historical evidence that such a gate ever existed. So we might still use that as a kind of a metaphor for describing our relationship with goods, that we feel that we must be sort of unburdened or have a, a neutral relationship with them or, or so on. But in fact, um, Jesus probably didn't mean it that way. Jesus seems to have meant this quite literally, which is why this young man responds so strongly. He's, he's grieved. He goes away grieving because he had many possessions. He thought Jesus meant it literally, and perhaps we should too. There are other ways around this passage. Some people say, oh yes, well, this was just a word to that particular young man in that particular time and place, and that we shouldn't take it necessarily as applying to us. Jesus just singled out the thing that this young man had as an obstacle in his life that prevented him from coming and following Jesus in, his, in the wholeness of his being. And therefore, if Jesus were to encounter us and we were to ask him the same question, Lord, what must I do to inherit life? We would get a different answer. Uh, well, you've got to, uh, you know, give up anger, or, well, you have to give up, uh, you know, your, your pride or your greed or, right, whatever it is. That's a very tempting thing. The problem with that is that just as this young man goes away grieving when he gets this word of conviction from the Lord that sort of cuts right down into the quick of it, right to his soul, just as he has that reaction, so would we. If we were to encounter Jesus on the street and ask him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he gave us a word as powerful as he gives to this young man, we would be similarly grieved. We would be similarly freaked out. We would think, oh my God, did he just ask me to do that? Whatever that might be. So it doesn't really get us off the hook. It doesn't really get us off the hook. The fact is, this is an uncomfortable, difficult passage that convicts us that sort of encounters us, as rich as we are in Western society especially, with a moment of discomfort. And any effort to sort of tame that down does a bit of disservice to the sharpness that is the word. Now, I'm not saying that we should necessarily go and sell everything uh, and, 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 and follow Jesus in the way that this young disciple was asked to do. But here's an interesting example. There was a, this uh, religion professor in the States who, writing about this passage, he said he often has parents of his undergraduates come up to him and say something like, you know, it's great that Jimmy is following his interest in blah, but what can he do with a major in blah? You know, what, what will he do for a living? The fact is, I'm not sure the parents of the young man would have been so pleased with what Jesus said to him. Uh, the fact is, most parents have this concern. They want their children to be you know, relatively stable in life, to have the things that they need, to perhaps have children of their own, and so on. And this kind of a gospel is a threatening word. So he says all the time, parents come up to him and they say, what are my child's prospects for a successful career in X? In his case, he's a religion professor, so even more, the hair gets pulled out. How can my child possibly make a living in religion? And it is not that easy, but how do you make a living in religion, right? They ask him. He says that he has yet to have a parent come up to him and say, I really hope that my child uh, gives up everything and serves the poor. <laughs> I hope that my child attains great spiritual development as a result of having a major in religion. He has yet to have any parent come up to him and say, I hope my kid is the next Bonhoeffer or Mother Teresa. You see, we love to hold up heroes of the faith like Bonhoeffer, this man who stood up and resisted the Nazi regime, this man who went to his death. Before he did, he wrote in one place, when Christ calls a man, he calls him to come and die. Whoa! Bonhoeffer, who, when he went to the gallows, said, this is the end, but for me, the beginning of life, right? We look at that man who literally gave up his life, resisting evil. He was involved in, in trying to assassinate Hitler, of all things. This man went to his death, and we look at that example, and we think, there is a hero of the faith. But how many of us would really go to jail trying to assassinate someone as evil as Hitler if we were in the same position? 
Or how about Mother Teresa, who went around the streets of Calcutta picking up the dying and taking care of them? We might say that it is indeed good to give away all your possessions and to dedicate yourself so fully to the richness of life of others, as long as you indeed already are Mother Teresa. <laughs> But if someone were to come up to us and tell us quite seriously if they wanted to go to India and work in hospices and take care of the poor, and if they had no money to do it, they were just going to go, they were going to hitchhike their way to India and do this work, would we support them? Or would we not say something like, whoa, whoa, calm down, a mission trip, that's a great idea. Why don't we begin to, with a committee, and then we'll do some fundraising, and we'll pay for your ticket to fly over, and we'll give you some money so that you can do that work for a limited time, go for six months, nine months, a year, and then you come back and you can tell us about your mission. Right? That's how we generally like to do it. But here this word is in Mark that convicts us all with this sharpness. Are you really ready to give it all up? In other places, Jesus says that if something prevents you from coming close to God, you should cut it off. If your hand prevents you from being with God, you should cut it off. Better to enter the kingdom of God maimed than to have your hand and be tossed into hell, as it says. Wow, the convicting word. As I said before, if we were to encounter Jesus now, I think it would be a different word of conviction for each of us. I think that thing, that sharpness that we would experience, would be different and unique for all of us. But are we prepared to receive it? Because I believe that we already have. Look through the gospel. It's not just about wealth and giving up. It's about all kinds of other things that might convict us where we are now and cause us to change our whole lives. That is the power of the words in this book. That is the power of the gospel of God. So, beloved, I want you to read scripture with that kind of openness, that you're ready to receive that piercing sword, that you have your armor off, so that when God tries to strike you, you will be struck to the bone, dividing bone from marrow, soul from spirit. And now I'd like to, to hear from some of you what this kind of stirs up for you, this, these uh, scripture lessons from today. Anybody want to share something?